So before we open to the floor, I would like to first uh, thank Cardinal Luxon for his inspiring, enlightening re-emphasis of how our Catholic Church are called to live our faith by affirming the importance of integral human development that in his presentation he has affirmed what Archbishop uh, William Goh this morning has presented the two lungs of the, of, of, of the reality of living of our faith and the, that must be put into action for the whole integral need of the human person. So I would like to open this to the floor. Now whoever wishes to raise any question, please uh, identify yourself and then keep your question short and not give another speech because we <laughs> don't, may not have enough time. Anyone who wish to, yes. Actually, the chairman is here, mine. And the question is the question of migrants in Singapore, particularly. So, by way of background, uh, the thing is this that in Singapore, um, there is a controversy to say that migrants are just economic digits to our economic well being. So, for instance, if for um, this from domestic workers, when they come in, they are given a special pass known as a work permit. And in the, within the work permit itself, they are not allowed to marry or they are not supposed to have, be pregnant. If they are, they get deported. Now, when you talk about integration of human development, it's about also about rights, things that are not visible, things that are not tangible. When you don't have this kind of integration uh, at this kind of legal level, not visible, unspoken, how do you, how does the Vatican engage governments on this kind of issues? Do we confront them or do we engage them in dialogue? Thank you. The, as I try to say, the issue, the issue of migration and migrants and refugees is an issue that is very close to the heart of Pope Francis. And not just Pope Francis, uh, there's no way, if you take the Old Testament and scriptures, the Jupiter, the, the Jews, okay, the, the, the direct command to them was that if there's a migrant or a refugee in your midst, you shall treat him just as you treat a brother. Okay, this I know became a, it's recently become an issue in, Jeru in Israel. When the president threatened to you know, uh, send away refugees and whatever, a group stood up and said, this is against the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Okay, which basically drags that. So, Pope Francis is very much uh, encouraging local churches to extend Okay, uh, assistance towards them, and to invite them to, to, to consider them as other human beings in need. Okay, it's not just statistics about 12,000 people on the street, no, but at the end of the day, you deal with another human being in a certain you know, precarious condition. So, Pope Francis does two things. While he encourages and calls upon us, churches, whatever, governments and all, to be welcoming and to be receiving these people, he also says each one should discern about its capacity to be able to deal with this issue. So welcome them, but be discerning. In other words, see and judge well about your own capacity to be able to be dealing with the issue. So the two things he says are that, about welcoming them, popularly the Pope Francis talks about four things. Welcome them, protect them, promote them, means give them education, whatever, and work on their integration. These are the four verbs that Pope Francis directs the church or help the church do. 
welcome, protect, promote, and integrate. Okay, but in suggesting all of this or recommending all of this, he still advises governments to still be discerning about their own capacities and whatever to be able to handle this. So the issue of migration is of that nature. But the invisible thing that you talk about, the human dignity at all, human dignity expresses itself in human rights. Human rights are the expression of the dignities that people have. So yes, human dignity, everybody talks about, but human dignity is what inspires the different rights okay, that we talk about. So it is in the different rights of people that you conclude or discern about their dignity and everything that contributes to what you call their dignity. So those rights, when protected and ensured, you pushing and promoting the dignity of people. So Mark, yes, uh, while we try to en engage and encourage the government to have a more holistic, integral understanding and acceptance of migrants, there's also the other part of initiative, personal initiative, of what I personally can do to help uh, relate to and respect uh, these migrant people. Second question. Your minutes. Your minutes was your head one of the higher hands. Please use use the mic, please. My name is Thomas and I work in the migrant ministry. Uh, a question that we have uh, for you is that a lot of us who work in a as a receiving country, as a host country, we encounter problems that are often generated as a result of the source country. Uh, but our mandate is to actually work here in Singapore, for example. From your experience working with the other officers, what can we do more that can uh, effectively solve some of the problems uh, working upstream in the host country? You know, uh, what is happening in our world sometimes gives us the impression that this is the first time in history that we're dealing with migration problem, but that's not true. That's not true. In point, point of fact, Pope Francis has done a video showing how in the different periods in the history of humanity, mass of people have always moved. So what we experience now is not the first time in history of humanity that we have migrations. We, we've always had migrations, okay, in different places and different people, whatever, you know. So migration is a very normal human phenomenon. Okay, migration is a very normal human phenomenon. Uh, it is not, it's not something that is just happening today. So that's not about source country and whatever country, so that is where they arrive first and where they send after that and all of that. This is the thing that is being sorted out in Europe now. When they come to Lampedusa in Italy, what does Italy do on behalf of the European Union? Okay, lately they've come together, they come to some kind of agreement about the quota sharing. But we also know that with this, there's also a big issue. Some countries in Eastern Europe refer to their historical past and set an account of what, you know, two things. Some look at the migrations and look at their constitution. Where are they coming from? So for some, it's not simply migration, but migration which is essentially Islamic, okay? And when they look at those coming from Afghanistan, Syria, and all of that, say most of them are Muslim, then some countries are a little bit, you know, fearful. Like, like Hungary, okay, which will which say that in the past, in the very, very way, way past in the background, there were historical conflicts and wars between the Ottoman Empire and all of that, so they don't, so that kind of thing can happen. But essentially, all of those aside, what we're dealing with is, uh, you know, South country and all of that, if it is possible for any country to be of help to people in need, that is just what all of this requires. 
and sometimes to motivate people to be so you know, open to helping other uh, people in need. Pope Francis sometimes referred to a very common experience. When he went to the United States in 2015, before the Congress I was speaking, what he said that all of us are migrants and children of migrants, because he himself is also Italian, born in Argentina. His grand 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 whatever to migrate. So he says, before the American Congress, he said, all of us are children of migrants, including you in the US Congress. Therefore, let us be open to others. And in a very real way, there's hardly any continent or any country in this world which has not dealt with migration. Okay, so then this should probably dispose us to be a little bit more receptive towards needy people now than before. It's a question of people, and, and this is going to worsen now, huh? because climate change is going to throw some more people always on the move. All the scientific evidence, you know, in Europe, the big satellite in space called Copernicus is the European satellite in space. <laughs> Copernicus satellite, the latest indication that is transmitted to the air, predicts that this is going to be the hottest year, okay, in European history. If this water is going to be in Europe, what will we be in Africa? So more waters are drying up. This is the problem in California now. All the waters for agriculture are drying up. We have the same in Africa, Chad. Lake Chad is almost just a mere fraction of its size. Water is going to be an issue. Agriculture is going to be an issue. And there's going to be some more people moving away on account of you know, climate change consequences. So we're going to be witnessing some more people moving around. And so our world leaders are probably to, you know, to see how well we can deal with this issue. Probably if we can intervene in ways that we make people improve upon their environment so they can stay, so much the better. My own personal feeling is that the migration system is like, you know, you open a tap. When you open a tap, water runs out. And when water runs out, you can do one of two things. You can begin to wipe the water. But if you don't turn off the tap at the same time, you will be wiping water and drying that in all days of your life. So you should, while you dry the water, you should also find a way of turning off the tap. And that just means for me that our world political system, UN, EU, and all whatever, should find a way of changing the paradigm of development to bring some kind of development in some of these things so people do not need to move, so they can stay at home. That's a better option than making people move and try to pay now. EU wants to pay money to Libya to keep their migrants there, but they're still not in their own homes. So it requires a new vision of you know, our political arrangement and our economic system to be able to deal with the situation. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, there's a question. One more. Yeah. Um, I'm very heartened to hear uh, Cardinal Thaksin says that in the eyes of the church, integral human development goes all the way back to the yet to be born. So my thoughts flow to these unborn, who, by the choice of their own parents, with the permission of a very lax policy, are removed from the face of the earth, not even allowed to develop it in the first place via abortion. Abortion is legal in Singapore, even when the fetus is already 24 weeks. So my, my take here is, this anti-life policy, which exists right in our own doorsteps. It is definitely an absolute violation of the sanctity of life. Specifically, I like to know and I wonder how our local archdiocese deal with this moral issue regarding the unborn who are fated to be how does the 
church here um, intervene in this policy. So that's thank, you, thank you. So this morning, our conversation was about integral human development. Uh, it could simply also have become a conversation about uh, human development or human ecology, as sometimes it is put. Uh, the teachings of the Pope about ecology are in two senses. They talk about natural ecology and they talk about human ecology. Both of them are ecologies. And they refer to the surrounding conditions which enables anything to thrive. If you talk about natural ecology, it is just a natural environment which enables you know, nature to thrive. If you talk about human ecology, it is also the moral and ethical conditions which need to prevail to make the human person okay try. Okay, in which case the issue of abortion, uh, you know, intervention at the beginning of life or euthanasia or palliative care at the end or whatever, so assisted suicide, all of those things come up under consideration. So at the end of the at the, the beginning point is that again it's a question of uh, our understanding of the human person. Our Christian anthropology comes again. Who is the human person? And what is human life? If human life was created and given to us as a gift, then we have no right to treat this gift any way and anyhow. If, 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 if life is a gift given to us, then we need to respect it as a gift. Something so we, we need to be circumspect about how we treat it. So we know that this vision about life or anthropology, we call Christian anthropology, not everybody, okay, uh, accept this vision, but that's also why there is a dialogue and conversation. In the dialogue and conversation, we do not force people, but we propose the value and the wisdom in what we have. Okay, and engage in dialogue. Uh, and this dialogue happens between science and faith, physics, biology, whatever type of thing, and, and religious positions. We are invited simply to be in dialogue about several human situations. And dialogue is also a way of evangelization. That's from where we present the values and everything we have. So the, your question there is a question about human ecology. What are the set of moral and ethical conditions which we need to have to make human life flourish? And those ethical conditions regard conditions at the beginning of life, towards its end, what you do, how you may intervene. And it's becoming more and more complicated with genetic engineering, bioethics, and all of these interventions. Huh? So it's always becoming a complicated issue. But the one thing that we may never Forgetting this is that human life is a gift of God to us. And as a gift, whatever we do to it, we should remember that as a gift, we do not have the right to abuse this gift which has been given to us and to use and use it judicious. Thank you. Another question? Yeah, Patrick. Um, to continue your evidence, following on what the sister said, I came across a statement that what is legally valid is actually morally unacceptable. Would you have any comment on that, your evidence? Thank you. Would you like me to repeat? Yeah, so what is legally valid is morally unacceptable. I, I wouldn't put it that way. 
What is legally valid is morally unacceptable. It doesn't follow. It doesn't follow that what is legally valid is also morally unacceptable. What I thought you were going to say is that what is legally valid and permissible is also morally permissible. That's how some people argue. That when something is legally acceptable, then morally you can also do it. But that's not what you are saying. What you said is that what is more moral, what is legally acceptable is not morally unacceptable. Is morally unacceptable. No, uh, okay. No, uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see that before because some things can be legally acceptable, which can also be morally uh, acceptable. But not everything which is morally, uh, not everything which is legally uh, acceptable, which is also morally acceptable. In relation to abortion, whether uh, okay, yeah. So so uh, so so there can be a legal law in a country. This is the case now, probably here. In Ireland, they just passed the law. In some states in the United States, in some states in Europe, also they, they make some abortion legal. Okay? But the fact that it's legal does not mean it's morally acceptable. Okay? For us, that thing may be legal, but it's not morally acceptable. So, the court of law, the court of law can sometimes come out with things which are morally or ethically valid but not necessarily. The court of law, you, uh, when, when in the court of law, you trying to do something which according to the state ensures the, the rights or whatever to, of the citizens. What we would wish was that whatever legislations are enacted, okay, for the well-being of citizens would also consider the moral implications. This is not always done. Sometimes it is only the expediency or whatever thing of the citizens which carries the, 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 the day. We will wish that it goes beyond that. In fact, now that we have artificial, I'm taking it in another direction now. A, a, a question that is before us now is, for example, artificial intelligence and what you can do. Okay, with artificial intelligence. That's a clear case of, uh, again, about it, that it's not even everything that is doable that must be done. Okay, it's not everything that is doable technologically that is good to do. I mean, we can, artificial intelligence with the robotics and whatever, whatever, we can do robots and, and, and program it to, you know, to just, you know, strike anything. And now they've been even trained to be able to judge or, you know, or to think and all of that. So our world is getting more and more whatever type of which needs precisely the guidance of morality or ethics. For that, let me briefly, if I have a little bit of time, I'll be sure one minute there. <laughs> Just in the light of this, we use the word ethics. Ethically, morally, what does it mean? Here in Singapore, you're probably close to India. Philologists, okay, uh, suggest that the word ethics comes from an old Sanskrit word for a tomb, which means when you pile up stones to create a fence to protect your sheep inside, you do the tomb. Okay, so. A two then is when you create a system to protect what you cherish. So in this sense, ethics is when you develop a system of thought to protect the values that you have. Then you develop an ethical thinking. Okay, and certainly we do have values. And in that case, what do we do to protect the values that we have? And that's why things cannot always be legal but sometimes they also have to be ethical, okay, by way of protecting the values that we have and we cherish.
before Cardinal N, perhaps I would like to make a brief comment and, and ask is that a question. You know, first world countries like Singapore, while we have heard much in today's presentation about the importance of how, how integral development is very much part of the faith. In a first world country like Singapore, now the biggest challenge is really secularism, materialism, relativism that promotes individualism. So the big challenge is how do we even keep the people in the, in the church practicing the faith? That individualism is, is really the, the big challenge, uh, let alone promoting integral human development. What would the Holy Father's thought be? Would there be a new encyclical following popular progressive 50 years ago? No, okay, so thank you, Father. Uh, in a way, the Sekaka letter allowed us to see already responds to some of this. Lauda to see says that everything in the world is connected. Okay? Everything is interconnected. Everything in the world is interconnected. We human beings, we were taken from the earth. We breathe the air of, the, of nature. And we are sustained by the gift of nature. Therefore, we are bound and connected with nature. Okay? Secondly, secondly, by, by reason of creation, Okay, God, so our, then going into our Christian and our anthropology, so God created Adam, and then the Bible says they brought the animals for him to name, and then he found no party. Okay, so God created a woman who was then a partner. Okay, so Adam is different from animals, animals are not partners of Adam. So a woman was created. And the woman's creation was significantly again in the Bible, taken from the side of the of, of the of, of man. And the Jews help us understand that by saying that woman was created not from the bone, from the head, otherwise the woman would be above man. Okay? Neither was the woman created from the bone of the foot, otherwise man could step on the woman. But the woman was created from the bone of the side, which means that the woman is the partner, an equal uh, partner of man. This is a very basic thing, but it's a basic sense of the relationship between man and woman. We know that there are some cultures which put the woman very below the man, but that is not biblical. That's another culture. So that is a thinking that we, with our biblical understanding, need to evangelize that this is not how that thing is. So it is also with another side of uh, the human person. The, you know, Adam created the image and likeness of God. The only way that you pass on the image or the dignity that God created is through birth. Okay, you pass on the image that Adam had only through birth. There is no other way for humanity to pass on the image of God. He passes on the image and the likeness of God and so dignity only through birth. There's no other way. You cannot buy dignity from the store. Now you can get somebody who is born and then goes to buy dignity. But, but human is created to pass on the dignity that he has only through birth. And this dignity at a certain point created brothers. Okay, brotherhood means that we are different but we share the same dignity before we go, we are from the same womb. Because we are from the same womb, we have the same dignity. We are different, but the same dignity. Therefore, the nature of the human person from birth was always that of brotherhood. Human society is based on brotherhood. Living uh, together. Therefore, when we have a tendency of each one thinking that he alone exists, it's also something which is not true of the human nature. We are not created as such. We are created to be in relation. Because when there is individualism, then there's no justice. Uh, there's no justice because justice is a relationship term. When you respect 
the demands of the relationship in which you live, then you are a just man. And what is the relationship? The relationship we live in, first and foremost, is between us and God. Then between us and another person, between us and creation. And respecting the demands of this relationship makes us just. And when we abuse the demands of the relationship, we become unjust, we become sinners. And so for us Christians, again, this is the meaning of you know, our reference to Jesus as our justification. We use that expression in the New Testament, huh? that Jesus is our justification. What does that mean? Jesus is our justification means that Jesus makes us just again. It means Jesus restores us in relationship. But if we live individuals and there's no relationship, then what did Jesus come to do? He is in a relationship with whom? When each one lives on his own, for his own life, and not bound in any relationship with no responsibility for one another, then Jesus didn't come to do anything at all. So individualism, that appears to be the thing of, you know, each one for himself. But then we also say that God for us all. You know, and so the thing about individualism, that may be a sense that, you know, it's like, how much I forget, I'll see the card again, say in one minute. <laughs> but, 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 but it is this, it is this, you know, the tendency to succeed and to merit, okay? Our world is driven up by merit. I merit this, I merit this, I merit this. That makes us forget the fact that there is a gift. Okay, certain things are grace and gift. The increasing tendency is that everybody gets what he has merited. You go to university, you pass an exam, therefore you merit high position, you merit this, you merit this, you merit that. But this has the tendency of making us forget the fact that our life itself is a gift. So it's, it's not everything about us which is our merit, but also a lot of basic things about us are gift. You know, grace of God that is given to us. When we begin to think a little bit more about that, we begin to recognize that the emphasis is not just I. We used to have a story we tell at home about two priests living together. And there was a football match. And each one was watching the match in his room. Okay, although there's a common TV, everyone wanted to watch the zoo. But when there's a goal, then they all crowd come out run and go, go, to want to share the joy of goal. So, so at a certain point, you want to be alone, but the time comes when you want a relationship. So the individualism means look at how much stress there is in society because there's no communication. Each one seeks to deal with everything himself. There's a lot of suicide. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of psychological imbalances growing up because we were not created to be alone. We are not islands. So sometimes uh, this is the thing that from our church point of view as a religion or Christian, we can, you know, evangelization is we have something we can share with society. We have a vision of our life that we can also propose. Maybe difficult, but it's, we can still propose it. And we, we, we propose it by first creating like a cell. If your charity character group over here is a cell in which a new way of living is developed, that can then become attractive to others. Okay, gradually begin to expand. I am told, I have not verified it because I have not, not been to mainland China yet, but I am told that the, the way Christian church spreads in China is by household. Friends come together, they invite friends, they invite friends, and they build the community and from the community to begin to expand. Thank you very much, Karina. Let us thank you. Thank you very much. Let us invite Janet uh, to present Madam Sister. A token of our beseeching, please.